be. Um, that culture is uh, one way that we will um, that we that we resist. So please enjoy it. Um, please again put your name in the chat um, and you know put thing, put say how you're doing in the chat, but please be respectful. Um, and we will start right after this. Right, thank you. And Aliyah put in the chat um, about this video. Um, and sorry, the sound is still going. Um, so wanted to wanted to just say thank you and um uh sorry, um Aliyah put the song about the information about the song in the chat, and I'm going to pass the word on to um, my comrade, Margaret Kwateng. She is the campaign lead national organizer, organizer at Grassroots Global Justice, where she is working with members to build a regenerative feminist economy. Prior to joining GGJ, Margaret worked for years as a community and labor organizer in working class communities of color with rank and file nurses. In 2014, she founded For the Many, a multi-issue community organization in upstate New York. Since joining GGJ in 2020, Margaret has been leading GGJ's national campaign, 
at the intersection of climate and racial justice, care work and demilitarization with a shared framework of divestment from harm and investment in care. Thanks a lot, Margaret. Thanks so much, Nico. Um, so yes, again, my name is Margaret Watson. Um, I'm with Grasses Global Justice Alliance and I will be moderating today's panel. So thank you all so much for kicking off Climate Week with a conversation that I feel is often not at the center of discussions on the environment, but is so central to the causes of climate change. Um, and that is militariz uh, militarism and colonialism. So at Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, um, where we're connecting grassroots movements here um, in the belly of the beast in uh, Turtle Island with those globally, um, we often say that we're at the intersection of three major crises. Um, a crisis of ecology, of economy, and of empire. With this constant drive toward consumption and expansion that's built into our extractive economic model, we're reaching the edges, the limits of our planet's ability to sustain itself. This ecological crisis is driven by um, our economic system and colonialism is a major manifestation of that. Um, and it's now leading us to a point where there actually are increased calls for militarization. For those who are located um, in Turtle Island in the United States, you may have been hearing right, climate change as a threat to national security, um, which is naturally then going to lead to calls to increase funding for this institution that is already the number one consumer of fossil fuels globally, the US military. So um, we're going to be hearing a bit about that today, as well as hearing about some of the immediate impacts, right, of the production, the testing and use of weapons and war um, and militarization on communities all over the world. So with all of this happening, it can feel um, like there maybe isn't enough, that much hope. Um, and I want to, to note, I want to bring into this conversation that while we are going to be highlighting the conditions that we're facing, we're also going to be talking about the resistance, um, in particular in the Congo, in the Pacific, um, and in the Middle East. Collective struggle and uh, liberation against colonialism, militarism, and the climate crisis are so intimately interconnected. It is uh, going to be impossible to engage in uh, decolonialization without also engaging in demilitarization and also um, then being able to decarbonize as a result of that. It's often indigenous people around the world who are protecting the majority of our world biodiversity um, in tandem with also preserving and protecting cultural legacies. Um, and these folks are often on the front lines of militarism as well. So I appreciate you all joining us for this conversation, which we know could not be more critical than in this moment when we're seeing an ongoing genocide happening in Gaza and uh, an escalation of war as we're seeing happen in Lebanon, um, that it's critical that we are continuing to, to call on the United States to stop sending weapons to Israel to halt the genocide um, and more deaths uh, and to have a de-escalation of war. Um, I know many folks uh, are engaged in uh, communities and in actions that are happening all over the country um, today, and I'm sure in the following days. Um, and so we're holding in our in our hearts and in our minds um, the the context that we're in, being not hypothetical, being right here in front of us right now. So with that, I want to um, pass it to our first uh, speaker. Um, which is Aisha uh, Mansour, who is a Palestinian Muslim grassroots organizer based in Oakland, Cali California, uh, Ohlone territory, um, and who was raised in Seattle, Washington. Um, as an internationalist, she is, a dedic is dedicated to anti-colonial and anti-imperialist movements worldwide. Um, she's currently at Honor the Earth, but also an active organizer with the Palestinian youth movement. Um, and at Honor the Earth, Aisha's work focuses on uh, interconnected liberation struggles from Turtle Island to Palestine. She holds a master's in ethnic studies from San Francisco State University and a bachelor's in interdisciplinary studies from Western Washington University. 
Um, so with that, I want to one, remind um, you all who are uh, watching this panel um, to please add and ask questions in the chat. Um, and two, I want to pass it to you, Aisha. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, it's a really important moment for us to be to be together. And um, I appreciate you bringing up Lebanon because it's actually how I want to I want to start us off. I, I felt that I couldn't speak about Gaza and I couldn't speak about the intersections of militarism and colonialism and the climate cr crisis without talking about what's happening in Lebanon right now. Um, so, you know, as of yesterday, we saw Israel expand its genocidal project from Gaza to Lebanon. Um, they're actively targeting civilian homes, hospitals, ambulances. The death toll right now is at 644 with over 1,500 injured. Um, and that's within the span of 24 hours. So to put that in perspective, uh, the death toll between Lebanon and Israel in 2006 was um, over was about 1,100. So this is more than half the casualties of a month long war in just 24 hours. The situation is dire and um, I actually wasn't sure that I was gonna be able to make this webinar today because of how much uh, things have escalated in the past 24 hours. But I'm here because um, this escalation in Lebanon is actually a perfect example of the intersections of colonialism and militarism. And uh, that's because we understand Israel as a settler colonial project. And that means that it's inherently expansionist. Um, and that's because settler colonialism is predicated on the accumulation of capital through extraction and land theft. And it's an ongoing project um, until the land is stripped bare, you know, settler colonial states will seek to expand. And that expansion can only be sustained through military occupation and imperialism. And so it's really crucial that we actually understand the ideology in order to grasp why Israel is so determined to expand its genocide from just Palestine and the Palestinian territories into a regional war. Um, it's, it's important for us to understand this ideology to even understand why it's annexing more land in the West Bank or why it has plans for Gaza after you know they, they complete a genocide, which as Palestinians, we don't believe that they're gonna be able to complete successfully because we'll resist. But um, it's also really imperative that we understand settler colonialism as an ideology um, to understand uh, their military strategy. So what we're seeing in Gaza and in Lebanon is actually something called the Dahia Doctrine. And the Dahia Doctrine is a military strategy that Israel created during its 2006 war on Lebanon. Um, and it calls for the massive disproportionate force and the deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure. So what do we mean by civilian infrastructure? We don't just just means schools, mosques, homes, like we actually are talking about our water systems, our agriculture, our livestock. Um, you know, we can rebuild a house, but it's going to take years to regrow our olive groves that have been there for thousands of years. And so what I really hope that people understand from this panel today is that settler colonialism is an ongoing system designed to perpetuate environmental violence against indigenous people. And what's happening in Gaza is just that, and we're about to see that happen in Lebanon unless we ourselves take action. Um, what's happening in Gaza is an intentional ecocide. It's an assault on the land itself, and it's meant to destroy the means of survival for Palestinians. Um, so what does that look like? In the early weeks of the invasion on Gaza, almost 90% of Gaza's greenhouses were destroyed, particularly in the northern regions, which um, had severe consequences for our food security. Right now, according to the United Nations, 96% of Gaza's population faces acute food insecurity, and almost half a million people are on the brink of starvation. Um, and that's, you know, not just it, right? Like Gaza's water sanitation systems are on the verge of collapse. Five out of six water waste uh, treatment plants have shut down. Um, our sewage is now contaminating our beaches, our soil, our fresh water supplies. The air is now filled with toxic smoke and burning waste. Families are forced to burn plastics and debris due to the lack of fuel. 
And um, the bombing campaigns have actually generated over 39 million tons of debris, which is an environmental hazard in and of itself because it's filled with asbestos and hazardous waste and human remains. Um, we're also seeing a, a big fear of what's about to happen to our water and soil because the destruction of solar panel of our solar panels is expected to leak lead and other heavy metals into the water system. And that's a perfect example actually of why this genocide didn't and this ecocide didn't start just a year ago. Um, because before October, Gazans on average received uh, four hours of electricity per day. And that's because the electrical grids were destroyed in the last war in 2014, um, and Israel now controls the electricity. So Palestinians have been forced to rely on solar panels. Now our solar panels are being destroyed, and the lead is leaking into our water and into our soil, which is impacting the way that we can obviously survive. So as you see, it's a continuous process to not only erase Palestinian lives, but to erase um, the land's ability to support those who remain. And um, yeah, the environmental destruction in Gaza is not just collateral damage, it's actually a systematic tool of war um, wielded with the intention of eradicating a people by stripping them from their land and their water and their food and ultimately our future. Um, and so I have some calls to action. Uh, I already, I, I know I'm over time already, um, but we can discuss more uh, in the Q&A at the very end, so. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Aisha. Um, some really, I think, key points that we want to continue to take with us through this conversation. Um, the idea of uh, the ideology of settler colonialism um, as like critical to how it's functioning um, and the environmental degradation that is happening as a result. Um, this sort of continuous consumption, extraction, and prevention um, of a people's survival. Um, so I want to um, now pass it to Naik, um, Naik Flores, uh, who is a queer Chamorro activist um, and artist from Guahan. Uh, Naik is the lead organizer of Proteja, um, Proteje, my, excuse me, um, Save Ritadan, uh, which is a direct action group dedicated to the protection of natural and cultural resources in all sites identified um, for Department of Defense live firing training in Guam. Um, Naik is also a core member of Marianas for Palestine, um, an independent Guahan. Naik also serves on the board of, for the Water Protector Legal Collective. Um, so with that, I will pass it to Naik. Thank you so much um, to the organizers and to Aisha and Margaret and Nico for speaking before me. Um, my name is Naik Flores. I am, I'm actually really not feeling well today, so I'm going to do my best, but I, I felt compelled to be here with this incredible panel. Um, truly honored and grateful to be here. Um, my name is Naik Flores. I'm calling in from Guahan. Guam is a military colony of the United States. We're one of the oldest settlements in the Pacific and one of the oldest colonies. Um, we were colonized by Spain for over 300 years and now by the United States for over 100 years. And uh, and for, for most of that, we've been resisting um, our colonization, but also um, our fight for self-determination and um, decolonization have been continuously thwarted by the United States government um, through military occupation, contamination, um, and, um, and, and political disenfranchisement. 30% um, of our island is occupied by, <clears throat> excuse me, by bases. And, um, you know, it, just sitting here in Guahan, it's, we can't just talk about Guam it, because we have to also talk about the islands north of us in the northern Medianas Islands. Um, right now, Guam is is experiencing a hyper militarized buildup, um, saying that we need these bases and this bigger military force here. That uh, it's setting us to be a place of force projection for the United States and the Pacific, and it's not just happening here. It's connected to the islands north of us. Um, 
in, in Tinian, for instance, there's a divert airfield being built. So should Guam get, uh, you know, destroyed in war in an attack from either China or North Korea, then the United States will take all of its military, a lot of its military resources to Tinian immediately. Now, a lot of people don't realize Tinian is also where the United States launched the two uh, uh, nuclear bombs that attacked Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II, um, devastating uh, that the country of Japan forever. Um, we're all still, we all just recently commemorated the, that attack. Um, also happening are, are big buildups in other parts of Micronesia, in Palau, in Yap, in the Marshall Islands. We also have to think about what's happening in the Philippines with five new bases there, the buildups in Korea and in Okinawa as well, the gendered military sexual violence against women, children, um, and our trans and two-spirit community members um, that are part of that military occupation. Um, this is also connected to Hawaii um, and the huge military presence there, the horrible war games such as Rimpak where Israel is practicing uh, the genocides in Pacific indigenous oceans, waters and lands, um, and the largest military exercise in the world. All of this is connected absolutely to what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in the Congo, what's happening in Lebanon right now. And um, a lot of people don't know just how closely a place like Guam is connected. You know, For instance, 30, like I said, 30% of the island is occupied by bases. One of the bases is a new urban warfare training range facility for the Marines, which is very much like the Cop City, um, urban warfare training range, which is directly connected to the training and the, uh, uh, the racism uh, associated in that city and what's happening in Palestine. As we know, Israel trains um, police to exact th that same violence. Um, we've also had uh, Iron Dome tested here in Guam. Now, right now, Guam is being set up for the construction of a missile defense system. And um, I, I'm gonna just share a few a few images really quick, but I wanted to uh, share that this is a great slide that was uh, created by our good friend, Dr. Issa Ariola from our Commonwealth 670. This was from the Times of Israel. Now it says the US military tests Iron Dome in Guam with eyes on threats from China. The thing is, is Iron Dome of course, we know it doesn't. It's it's ridiculous. It doesn't work, right? It's uh, but it's for short range missiles, and we would be attacked by long range missiles. But the money that was wasted, the environmental destruction that took place to test this here. But also, it's important to mention that this is the same rhetoric. This is the same rhetoric that the United States government and the Missile Defense Agency is using to justify the destruction and further contamination of our land here to build the missile defense system, saying that the missile defense system here in Guam would protect us much like the Iron Dome in Israel. So it's part of the propaganda also being used to militarize us. It's important to mention that both Boeing and Northrop Grumman have already made um, about $500 million in contracts for the construction of the missile defense system. These are the same corporations that made massive wealth, record-breaking wealth at the, in, you know, after October 7th. Um, so it's definitely all connected. Um, these are about there are about 20 sites around the island that they're looking at for the missile defense system. But because of this, they're also um, fast tracking all of the environmental assessments, all of the cultural assessments uh, to get this going. Um, they're going to this is going to also mean that they're going to occupy more indigenous land. Um, this is a horrifying graphic of the missile testing that they want to actually start as soon as December. Um, we just found out about this earlier this year. Just last year, there was an announcement for the missile defense system commenting period. And then suddenly this year, missile testing is going to happen in December. And what's really horrible about this image is that it, it totally has erased the Northern Islands. Um, the islands north of us, Luta, Tinian, Saipan, um, who are going to be directly impacted, and not just their economic zone, but uh, the safety of our ocean. As, in, as indigenous people of the Pacific, we are deeply connected to the ocean, and this is a desecration. They, the military has no plans for removal or remediation of, 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 these, uh, of these tests as they launch and collide missiles over the waters of our islands. Um, and they also um, want to um, affect access. This is going to affect access to our fishing grounds, but also to private properties. And again, there are no environmental or cultural assessments for any of those closures as well. Um, 
we are engaged in in many different kinds of strategies from international solidarity to legal strategies to direct action we have to do it all and uh there was a very condescending reporter from a local a local radio station um who had asked me who had framed this question you know in this way she said i, I hate i hate to be nihilistic but i'm going i'm going to be nihilistic what can we actually do she was questioning every single thing we were doing that moment. We were protesting outside of a community meeting for the missile testing. And I said, we have to do it all. We have to do the lawsuits. We have to talk. We have to be connected internationally to other communities in the struggle. We have to do these direct actions, but don't you ever once question an indigenous person for resisting their own colonization, the militarization and destruction of our homelands. That is, that is that's deeply disrespectful. It's unethical journalism, and you know, um, it's how, how just just don't do it. Just how dare you do it? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure where I'm at with time, but I do. I did want to bring up that you know, uh, just a few things that are happening. You know, the reason why Guam is also being built up for uh, with this marine base is because of indigenous Okinawa, uh, indigenous resistance in Okinawa to the horrible crimes that have been committed there by military members of the United States. And just recently, there were five cases that were hidden from the from the community of Okinawa that were just uncovered in the last year, five sexual assault cases by U.S. military members in, uh, in Okinawa, uh, one of which was a minor. Um, but um, the sexual violence that connects Okinawa, the Philippines, Guam, NMI, Hawaii, this is connected to anywhere the military presence is. So if we're truly looking, you know, uh, I mean, it's connected to the sexual, the sexual violence that we're witnessing happening right now in Palestine and in Lebanon. This is all connected, this oppression of bodies, of people, of, of it's anti-Indigenous, anti-woman, anti-Black. All of this is connected and all of this must be undone. Um, Mm -hmm. Last year, Guam experienced a super typhoon as well, and Philippines just saw some of the worst storms it's seen as well in decades. And we have to remember that while we're fighting this hyper-militarization and resisting the destruction to our lands and waters and, and the destruction happening in our communities, we're also at ground zero for the climate catastrophe for super storms taking place. And that is the United, as the Department of Defense is the world's largest contributor of fossil fuels. That's also part, it's also exacerbating all of these, these challenges for us here. Um, I think I've, I've been able to cover everything in a nutshell. I appreciate all of you for being here today. Um, thank you so much, Sidzos Masi, and I look forward to sharing the cost action later on in, in the webinar. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, yes, absolutely. We're going to be coming back to um, the calls to action uh, that you are naming, and I think these uh, incredibly important connections that you are raising um, between the struggle uh, happening in Wuhan, that in Palestine, that in Congo, um, and that even in militarized communities in Turtle Island, that the, you know, things like the Gillies program that are um, training officers in Atlanta in, uh, and in Israel, like that there's a, that type of connection that's happening, that weapons being tested in Guahan are being used in Palestine, are being used in, in Atlanta, that that's the type um, of, those are the types of connections we need to understand um, to be able to have uh, the resistance that we need um, to these types of colonial projects. Um, so with that, I want to pass it to our final uh, panelist, uh, Maurice Carney, um, who is one of the co-founders of Friends of the Congo and currently serves as the organization's executive director. He has pursued a pan-African solidarity mission for the past 25 years to build a global constituency in support of the Congolese people as they strive to fulfill Lumumba's vision of a free and liberated Congo. His educational and professional background focused on Black and African state politics. Um, having attended Grambling State University, University of Akron, and Howard University, um, and worked with the Joint Center for Political, Edu Political and Economic Studies the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and Reverend Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition. 
Um, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it to you, Maurice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you. Uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting uh, Friends of the Congo to, to be a part of this uh, very uh, critical and important uh, exchange. Uh, people, a lot of people are asking right now, what's going on in the Congo? Uh, what's unfolding in the Congo? Well, uh, the Congo, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a uh, country the size of Western Europe, in the heart of the African continent, straddling the equator, bordered by nine other African countries, arguably the richest country on the planet in terms of uh, natural resources, uh, long understood to be central uh, to the future of the African continent. It's been experiencing a over 25 year, quarter century war of aggression and plunder, uh, led primarily by US allies, neighboring countries like Rwanda's Paul, Kaga uh, Paga Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Yuri Museveni of, of Uganda. This war of aggression and plunder uh, has triggered what the United Nations says is the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II, when estimated 6 million Congolese have perished as a result of this uh, uh, ongoing uh, conflict. Half of those, half of those who have been killed are children under the age of five. Hundreds of thousands of women uh, have been systematically raped, uh, sexually terrorized as a form uh, of war strategy in order to displace communities from resource rich areas uh, so that the minerals can flow out of the country. That is the current situation uh, of the Congo, this ongoing seething conflict, which has escalated uh, within the, uh, the past uh, few years. Now, this conflict couldn't happen and could not have continued the way it has without the backing of the United States. The United States provide arms, financing, training, intelligence to its allies, Rwanda and Uganda, uh, as they continue to uh, wage uh, uh, this uh, war of aggression and, and plunder. Uh, in addition to that, uh, much like uh, Israel, when international bodies attempt to hold uh, these war criminals, uh, those who have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity in the Congo. The United States uh, often runs uh, diplomatic and political interference. So it makes it diff very difficult uh, to bring an end to the imp impunity, to inject accountability, and to deliver justice for the Congolese people. Now, all this is happening within the context of a country that uh, is basically holding to its original design, the colonial design. Congo is a country that was created by Europeans, 1884-1885 Berlin Conference. And it was created so that it could serve as an outpost for the extraction of natural resources that would ultimately fuel and power Western industry. 1885 to 1908, the ownership of King Leopold II, uh, rubber and ivory were extracted at that time. Uh, to power the bicycle and auto industry. Uh, C Congo is uh, uncanny in, in a sense, because uh, as we see advances in capitalism, uh, technology, uh, we see the suffering in the Congolese people uh, uh, continue. Uh, so you have uh, where the, in the middle of the, the, the century, where the United States launched its Manhattan Project, which ultimately developed the atomic weapons that were dropped in uh, Japan. Well, the uranium that was used for that came out of the Congo, some out of Canada, but the overwhelming majority and the highest quality came out of the Congo. Uh, fast forward to today, as we make advances in, in technology at dawn of the 21st century, where we see the cell phones and the laptops and uh, a range of electronic devices. Well, they're powered by Coltan, uh, Columbi Tantalite, where Congo has 64% of the world's reserve. Even as we move, uh, from these electronic devices to the effort to make this green transition and develop electric vehicles. Uh, we see again uh, Congo looming large, where it produces 70% of the world's cobalt, uh, a key ingredient that's vital to the functioning of these uh, electric, uh, electric devices, particularly electric vehicles. So that colonial legacy is still very much in place where the, context, uh, where the conflict is unfolding. And how do we know this? Well, a few things. 
when the Congolese people, about 110 million people, population inhabitants, according to the World Bank, 70 million live on less than $2.15, an extreme uh, poverty. Nearly 7 million uh, Congolese are internally displaced. Up to 25 million are in need of emergency uh, support. Now, this is in a country where economists say there's an estimated $24 trillion worth of wealth, natural wealth in that country, yet 70 million live on less than uh, $2.15 a day. Now, why is this happening? At the same time, right, we talk about a country that's uh, uh, steeped in a colonial leg legacy, uh, actually a quintessential example of, uh, of it that you could probably find in the world. At the same time, uh, we see there's this Israeli billionaire by the name of Dan Gertler that the Treasury Department uh, sanctioned except for uh, engaging in corrupt practices in the Congo, fleecing the Congo for an estimated $1.6 billion or so. Even though he's on the sanctions list by the United States, Dan Gertler continues to get royalties from, uh, from concessions that he's acquired over the years. Those royalties uh, account for about $200,000 a day for him. So 70 million Congolese living on less than $2.15 a day. One Israeli billionaire who repatriates his uh, gains to, to Israel, $200,000 a, uh, a day. So uh, the Congo continues uh, to be uh, plundered and plundered and suffer in relative obscurity. And this is striking that this occurs in this uh, such uh, silence uh, around the suffering of the Congolese people. It's striking because Congo is central the two dominant phenomena of our time. On the one hand, it's critical when we talk about combating the climate crisis. It's part of the second largest rainforest in the world uh, behind the Amazon, often referred to as the second lung of the world. However, it sequesters more carbon than all the tropical rainforests combined, Amazon, Borneo, you name it. In addition to that, it's home to the largest tropical peatlands. Peatlands uh, is an area where foliage and sediment has accumulated for uh, thousands of years and carbon is trapped in, in the soil. The peatlands in the Congo Basin is the size of England. And if that carbon is released, it could produce up to about 20 years of pollution that will come from the burning of fossil fuels uh, in the United States. So it is vital when we, uh, and indispensable when we talk about combating the climate crisis that the, the Congo Basin rainforest is preserved and preserved primarily by its indigenous inhabitants, which is something we'll talk about a little, a little later. So uh, vital when we talk about combating the climate crisis. At the same time, it is key for the so-called green or clean energy transition, which is powered by rechargeable batteries. As I shared with you, Congo produces 70% of the world's cobalt, uh, which is the key ingredient in these rechargeable batteries. And we see the importance of Congo uh, coming to the fore. Uh, in the Congress, uh, for sure, and certainly in the administration. The Biden administration has launched what they call the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Uh, and it's an effort to combat the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And Congo is a testing ground for this, where the United States, the European Union, the G7 invested over a billion dollars in rehabilitating what they call the Lobito Rail Quarter. It's a the rail line that runs from the heart of the Congo mining districts in a place, district in a place called Kowesi that stretches right out uh, to the Atlantic at the, uh, through, uh, through Angolo, the Lobito port. In fact, Reuters well, reported that uh, President Biden is looking to go to uh, Angola. And one of the things on the top of, of the list is a uh, visit to, the, to Lobito and to examine what's unfolding with that quarter. The first shipment of copper came out of Lobito in December of, uh, of 2023. 20, uh, now, recall I talked to you about the colonial legacy of the Congo, how the infrastructure is still pretty much in place. Now here it is the European Union, United States, G7, investing in infrastructure in the Congo. They didn't invest in that infrastructure to go from Kowesi to Goma in the east, or Kowesi to Kisangani in the northeast, or Kowesi to Kinshasa, the capital in the west. They followed the colonial model, the infrastructure, from the interior to the ports to extract the war materials for the benefit of global industries. So that uh, legacy is ever present 
in the policies that we see coming out of the uh, colonial legacy. It's ever present in the policies that we see coming out of the administration. In addition to that, the United States has, has uh, passed a number of bills. Uh, bills are inter interlawed the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, and of late, the Inflation Reduction Act. All of them uh, have uh, uh, elements in there that deal with uh, appropriations to access critical minerals on the African continent, about $250 billion worth or so. So this is a top priority, not only for the administration, but also for the Congress. We've seen, we saw how the uh, climate justice groups, 350.org, Syria Club, uh, the labor groups, United Auto Workers, uh, in the wake of the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, rallied to talk to around the workers at the top of the supply chain. How are we gonna protect the workers at the top of the EV uh, supply chain? Uh, considering that we're now moving into a different sector from the com combustion engine, heading towards uh, net zero, uh, decarbonizing. Now, Cole, mm -hmm. I shared with you, Congo produces 70% of the world's cobalt. At uh, the top of the supply chain are the auto workers, but at the bottom of the supply chain are the children in the mines, are the women in the mines, are the, uh, the diggers. So one of the aims of organization is to present the human element in all of this discussion around policy, around strategic battles, around geostrategic interests. So that's a critical um, aim on the part of, uh, of Friends of the Congo in being a part of these discussions, uh, to bring that human element, the indigenous communities, the local communities to the fore as we advance policies, as we engage in discourse, and as we develop narrative about moving forward as a world community. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Maurice. Um, yes, that I feel like that truly has sort of lifted the veil in many ways um, around one, how the uh, energy transition happens. Um, and I think also um, such such important points, I think about uh, the sort of critical role that the Congo plays um, in the preserving of our uh, sort of natural landscape um, and in in sort of in the ability to do that type of transition. Um, and so why it is, has sort of this geopolitical significance um, and why it then has sort of had hyper exploitation, mm. uh, hyper extraction, um, and therefore why it's placed such, it should play such a critical role in, in our um, sort of global resistance and, and our, how we should have sort of all eyes on Congo in many ways. Um, so thank you for all of that um, framework. Um, I want to bring um, everyone up for sort of this final roundtable uh, conversation. Um, and I'm hoping that folks um, in answering uh, this next question can also share uh, your call to action um, so that people uh, on this call are able to um, yeah, in, engage in, uh, in actively um, supporting your struggles. Um, so I want to go um, back to Aisha um, uh, and ask about uh, the sort of about how the struggle um, around uh, environmentalism or um, the narrative of protecting the environment uh, has been weaponized by Israel in many ways um, through this concept of greenwashing um, and how that's a part of the settler colonial project. I recall talking to a comrade who was saying at some point, you know, Israel started talking about like vegan boots, you know, um, for uh, soldiers. Um, so, yeah, I want to pass it to you on that and um, also see if you're able to share calls to action. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. That's a great question. Um, I feel like I talked a lot about how climate crisis is exacerbated by militarism and specifically like Isra Israel's military conquest. But um, we didn't get to talk about uh, how that's not portrayed in the media. In fact, the opposite is actually what's portrayed in the media. Um, one of the most common slogans that was used in um, 1948 during the establishment of Israel was that um, Zionists were able to make the desert bloom. Um, and that was because of their technological advancements, right? Westerners were able to come and bring modernity to the Middle East and quite literally bloom the desert. And so... Um, for me, you know, the way that I understand that is, you know, Zionism really is the most pertinent example of modern day manifest destiny. Um, like many of the tactics are the same, right? Genocide, displacement, torture, mass rape, spreading of diseases, 
um, the playbook often feels the same. And, and that's a lot of the work that we do at Honor the Earth and why um, I think Palestinians feel so called to the struggle for liberation on Turtle Island, because we're, we're living through um, what we know this country has done for hundreds of years. And so um, the, the only difference that we see is that right now we're in this modern neoliberal era, right? So you can't look someone in the eye and say that we are the chosen people. And so therefore we deserve this land. Um, I mean, though the original documents of Zionism actually do say that, um, but that's beyond the point. Nowadays, right, you know, settlers can't be as explicit with it. They have to present their conquest as this like moral endeavor. And so um, when you hear the saying like a land for a people, for a people without a land, and that they were able to make the desert bloom, it sounds like a really pretty sweet deal, right? Um, and then you find out that that's not the truth, because then you understand the intersections of militarism and colonialism and the climate crisis. And, and then you can understand why Israel has one of the largest ecological and carbon footprints um, in the world per capita. They rank in the top 10 percent. Um, and despite the fact that it's a fairly small country, I mean, it's it's smaller than the size of the state of California. It's um, one of the top 20 weapons exporters and importers in the world. And we know that the war industry obviously creates like six to 10 percent of the air pollution in the world and accounts for 30 percent of the total environmental uh, damage that we see worldwide. And so um, I think it's really important. I know I've spent a lot of time talking about ideology, but I just I think it's really important that we're able to articulate what are some of the root causes of um, the climate crisis and um, be able to combat some of these like uh, neoliberal uh, greenwashing or you know rainbow washing, right? This this isn't just show up in the environmental uh, sector. It's also we see it with queer liberation. We also see it around labor. We see you know pink washing, red washing, faith washing, um, and so yeah, it's 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 really important that we're able to articulate this. Um, I. I, I just want to say, I know that there was a question that was dropped in the chat that was talking about um, um, how we're able to um, make sure that military's work um, are, are actually considered a part of the um, environmental responsibility in COP29 and 28. And um, I actually just wanted to talk about the campaign that we're working on right now, because I think uh, as the Palestinian people for the past year, you know, we worked so tirelessly to get ceasefire resolutions passed on a local level, on a national level, um, pressuring different politicians across the board. Um, and we were largely successful, I would actually say, with um, pushing ceasefire. Uh, but what we've seen now is that despite the fact that the word ceasefire is being thrown around left and right, we still have um, weapons being sent to the Zionist entity in the billions. And so um, we are really trying to forward a campaign called Mask Off Mersk because um, we know that weapons in the United States uh, is the number one thing that we're sending over to Israel right now. Um, it accounts for 60% of all the weapons imports that Israel gets by themselves. And so, um, and we know that that's not only being sent over via military ships, we actually know that it's being sent over um, through logistics shipping companies like Zim, like Maersk. And so um, we're heeding the call of the Palestinian General Trade Federation uh, or the Palestinian General Federation of Trade Unions, the PGFTU. Um, and um, yeah, we hope that everybody can can learn about the campaign, can sign the petition, um, get involved. It's a mass campaign. Um, if our politicians aren't going to listen to us and actually enact an arms embargo, then we as the people are going to enact a people's arms embargo. And so um, you can sign up, you can sign the petition, and then um, you can uh, register and we'll be able to send you guys updates as uh, the campaign progresses. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Isha. Um, yeah, and I did just to name, I did appreciate the, the ideological underpinnings that you were naming, because I think that idea of uh, transitioning from um, an economy that is centered on death in many ways um, of of people of the planet of um, livelihoods that uh, it yeah, and trying to transition to one that is centered on on life actually requires understanding the the logic of how sort of our systems are, are moving forward um, on this thread, I, I think, of uh, narrative, I wanted to go um, back to Nick. 
um, and ask if uh, you could tell us a little bit um, more about your organization, Protehe, Protehe, every time, um, and uh, what your experiences are have been around organizing um, against the uh, U.S. military um, in that context, um, and particularly how. Uh, sort of, yeah, community work has been on that, how it's impacting the ecosystems. Um, and I have uh, comrades in Guahan who often speak about how, um, you know, the U.S. military is such, such a large presence that so many people and just also end up having sort of family or friends that are um, entwined in the sort of colonial project in that way. And so um, I'm curious, yeah, your thoughts on how um, you've been able to sort of resist uh, the narratives that can get pushed forward in that context. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so yeah, the organization I'm with is Pratehi, and um, originally Pratehi the Texan Saver Tidian. We are we are going through a, a transition, um, and um, but with Pratehi, we're engaged in a lot of different strategies. I mentioned earlier, we do have two lawsuits against the the U.S. military. One is for their permit application to do open burn and open detonation. Um, on open on the open shore. They've been doing open detonation for over 40 years. They used to do open burning. They stopped in the last 20 years, but there's actually um, a couple of sites, uh, contaminated sites from open burning here. And um, it's it's very, you know, it's it very much impacts our our aquifer, our our sole source aquifer that provides our island um, 80 to 90 percent of the drinking water. Um, not only is it susceptible to open detonation, it's also susceptible to the firing ranges that the military has here. The, the Marine base has a huge firing range over our sole source aquifer as well. Um, five ranges, a, a huge complex. Um, They're going to be firing seven million rounds of, of, of ammunitions and other waste munitions uh, over that range every year. Um, so, you know, I, I can't help but think about the water contamination, water apartheid in Palestine as well. This is uh, something that, you know, we are experiencing in our own context here and um, through the U.S. military, through violence to the land from the U.S. military. Um, for three years, we've been engaged in the struggle against open burning and open detonation, and we just finally have a result uh where um, there was a joint letter from US EPA and Guam EPA finally to the Air Force. We've been gaslit, abused publicly by the military, by members of the Guam legislature, by, by members of the government, even by our own Guam EPA who, la who have laughed at us. It was clear they were gonna rubber stamp their permit application and had st and told us that we're not the subject matter experts. The military is the subject matter experts who should be trusted. Well, now they're they're singing another tune. They're sending another message. They're saying that they've they have violated the the law to to apply for that permit. Um, basically echoing all of our concerns about water, about coastal runoff. Um, but that's just one example. There are so many examples. Um, truly, uh, we have. Uh, we have uh, super fun sites here from the military. We have over 19 contamination sites. Um, it, it, the, the issues of illness associated with the contamination here are also tremendous. Um, Guam is also in the, the range for nuclear fallout from the testing that took place in the Marshall Islands. Um, that's something that we've never uh, seen justice for as well. Um, I, I, I can't in terms of you know changes to the ecology it's everything from the massive clearing and grading of land to the killing of, of endangered species um and the typhoon last year really emphasized the harm of that of those military activities because the whole northern coastline was compromised because of all of the clearing for that marine base and we saw possibly um the end to one of the last uh, to the last adult um endangered species of uh, the Hodson Lagu tree. Um, we, we've had, uh, it's affected our fishing, it's affected our the way our elders have gathered traditional medicines. Um, and th the struggle here is real, like you said, uh, first of all, Guam is a very poor community, so military enlistment here is quite high, and it is not unusual to have a family member or several family members who are in the military or who are veterans. I myself come from a family of veterans, uh, disabled veterans, very close relatives, my my own, you know, immediate family. Um, of course, it's made our work difficult. It's made, it's made it harder to, 
to critique the military, to analyze, you know, to publicly critique what's happening. And then when when we have when we're being abused and gaslit by our own politicians, you know, saying that we're being sensationalist or alarmists for calling, you know, for calling the alarm on all these things, um, it 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 really does it really does make it um make it challenging right now. The, a lot of the biggest economic factors here are the military development and construction and tourism, two very highly extractive, exploitive things that really are are interconnected and have been here um, in the in the sort of objectification of our island and our people is this exotic um, tropical destination as well to serve the military uh, uh, consumer. Um, and that's the same experience in the Philippines and Hawaii and Okinawa. And um, anyway, I, I, I have so much more to say, but I wanna wrap it up there with, I'll just say with our calls to action, you know, if folks can really, uh, we I don't unfortunately have one particular thing to point to right now, but what's coming up for us soon is the comment period for the missile, um, the missile defense system for the final EIS. And we what we do is we do these these pretty robust comment campaigns. And so we we want folks to um to to follow us for the call section around that, for the letter writing campaigns, the comment campaigns. Um, it's so important that we document the our resistance, our opposition, but also that we show that there's international you know, support for for us, and the, and also that people everywhere are making the connections to the to the atrocities happening to to places like the you know all around the world, the Congo, Palestine, Lebanon. Um, and I'll just leave it there because we're because we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I I want to yeah give the last few minutes here um to come back to you, Maurice, and maybe touch on where Nick was leaving off around uh, resistance. Um, so I, you spoke to um, the role of the United States in the financing, um, in arms and intelligence, um, and how that it has played such a critical role in what's happening in the Congo. And um, I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about AFRICOM um, and some of the resistance to, um, to that. Sure, sure. Uh, AFRICOM, you're talking about African Command, which was established by uh, Donald Rumson and George Bush in uh, October of, of 2008. And then was taken up by uh, President Obama and put on steroids uh, when he became in office, increased um, uh, almost 2,000% in terms of US military presence uh, on the African continent. In fact, uh, just a day or so around when uh, President Obama was uh, inaugurated, AFRICOM had uh, in, in 2009, Jan, uh, third week in January 2009, Africa had shipped uh, equipment and materials to, to the Rwandan government. So uh, we see that uh, the uh, militarization of the continent through Africa has increased, uh, whether we're talking about uh, Republicans or uh, Democratic uh, admin administrations, and uh, uh, ostensibly to support authoritarian figures who use those uh, weapons and not only to invade other countries in the case of Rwanda and Uganda, but also suppress their own population. So you get resistance uh, from, uh, from the local population. Uh, and that resistance uh, uh, is both uh, uh, internal, locally on the continent, and certainly external, where you have uh, organizations like Black Alliance for Peace or the Shut Down Africa campaign, campaign in the United States. Uh, so uh, the Congo really embodies uh, that principle of uh, because the challenges that it faces are both external and uh, internal, uh, it requires solidarity on a global scale because everybody wants a piece of Congo. So ultimately, however, uh, whether it's uh, militarization or resource exploitation or wars of aggression, it's those people on the front lines that are going to be uh, the primary movers that are gonna change the dynamics Right, that are going to bring about fundamental lasting change. That's why we uh, work with uh, frontline uh, organizers, uh, whether it's in the rainforest, the indigenous communities in the rainforest, uh, whether it's the Mbuti or the Twa or the so-called Pygmy, uh, who've been uh, victims of uh, fortress uh, conservation, a, uh, a legacy that comes from Teddy Roosevelt here in the United States, been shipped, uh, transported to Africa, where uh, local indigenous communities are displaced in the name of preserving the environment when they are, in fact, uh, 
the best custodians of the environment through their culture, their heritage, their spirituality. Uh, they have a vested interest in preserving and protecting the biodiversity. Uh, so uh, frontline communities supporting them, whether the rainforest at the epicenter of the conflict in the east of the Cong Congo, or in the front lines in the mining areas uh, in the south. Uh, in fact, what we've done uh, as Friends of the Congo, so trying to mobilize global support for frontline communities. And we brought them here to the United States uh, uh, for our eight city tour that uh, just kicked off today, actually, in, in New York uh, for Climate Week, where they'll be here from, uh, from now to October the 31st, uh, sharing with uh, people how they can, uh, people can get involved, telling their stories, uh, letting people know how they can be best in solidarity with them. Uh, there's a website that I'm gonna share, it's called basanja.org, so you can find out more about the tour. Uh, but ultimately, it's a strengthening of local institutions, uh, and that can come about with global solidarity that will put those local institutions in a position to confront their own local elites, because their local elites are also part of the global structure. They respond to international finance capital and not the needs and interests of their own people. So we, uh, the, the masses of the world, can come behind beside the Congolese people. And I'll leave it uh, with two quotes. Uh, one from, uh, from Patrice Lumumba in his last letter to his wife, Pauline, he said to the Congolese people before he was assassinated, he was overthrown and assassinated with the complicity of the United States. He said, uh, we are not alone. Africa, Asia, free and liberated people from every corner of the world will be found by the side of the Congolese. So we have an opportunity to fulfill on Lumumba's uh, prophetic words, uh, literally from the grave. And the uh, great revolutionary France Fanon probably put it best uh, with his prognostication, saying that in the book Toward African Revolution, he said, let us not forget the fate, the fate of all of us is at stake in the Congo. And that's, that is so much, so much uh, the case today, we take into consideration the climate crisis, the green energy transition. Uh, Congo is central uh, to our situation here on the, uh, on the planet. And Fanon hit the nail on the head. Thank you so much, Maurice. Um, and thank you, uh, Nick and um, Aisha. Um, I think we're going to be closing, uh, sadly, our panel here. Um, I wanted to share a little bit, I guess, about um, also the direction that Grassroots Global Justice Alliance has been taking um, around this, set, this intersection, which is um, we are in the process of building a campaign um, to divest from the US military budget um, and invest in non-militarized responses to, to climate disaster. Um, and I think that that type of uh, work is, is critical to be done in sort of in conjunction um, with uh, global movements that are uh, engaging in um, resistance uh, to some of these systems of, of harm. Um, so really appreciating uh, you all speaking um, to, to these struggles um, and bringing in connections um, of both sort of how militarization is happening, the impacts of um, the US military and weapons of war, and then also the ways in which our struggles um, must and are beginning to be connected. Um, we heard that in many of the panelists speaking to how they're, uh, how folks are, are already seeing um, what's happening where they're at um, as deeply intertwined um, and the outcomes as deeply intertwined. Um, to those uh, in other parts of the world. Um, so just want to uh, reiterate the, um, of course, urgent call for um, an arms embargo and, and an end to, to genocide in Gaza um, and the de-escalation of um, what has become an escalated uh, war moment. Um, and then also, uh, you know, to express solidarity with the, the Congolese people in this moment. Um, and, and wanting, Jack, I think, to, to close, um, yeah, saying, um, offering a round thank you um, to you all for, for joining us this evening. Um, and I know many folks will want to continue this conversation. Um, and so I'm uh, really hoping that, that people are able to stay connected through the calls to action um, that, that you all mentioned. Um, with that, I think we'll close here. Um, but thank you all and have um, a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Wonderful job in moderating. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank Mark. you, Nick and Aisha. Yeah. Pleasure being on with you. Thanks, Nico. Thank, thank you, so. everyone. All right. Amazing. And thank you to the ASL interpreters. Yes, yes, thank yes. You. Yes, thank Anna. You. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.
All right. Be well. Bye, y'all. Peace. Oh.